All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to uh, welcome to Space Drafts uh, number 68, which is Tucson's flavor of astronomy on tap. This is show number 68. This is our very first virtual Space Drafts edition. Uh, we're so glad that y'all have tuned in. Um, we missed our audience. We missed bringing you fun astronomy talks. Um, and we're so excited to bring you Astronomy on Tap in this new uh, virtual edition. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Um, my name is Logan Pierce. I'm your host for tonight. I'm a graduate student at Stewart Observatory here in Tucson. Uh, I'd like to introduce my co-host who is making her first ever Space Drafts appearance, Jasmine Washington. Jasmine, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, so hi, thanks for having me. I'm Jasmine Washington, an incoming graduate student here at Stewart Observatory, but right now I'm still in Virginia where it's already 10 p.m. So the stars are a little higher and my eyelids are a little heavier than if I were there, but it's great that having this online lets me participate. All right, well, we're so glad to have you. Um, okay, so I will get started with a brief introduction um, uh, PowerPoint. Let me get that up and running. Oh, I can't find it. Shoot. There it is. All right. All right. All right. Um, thank you and uh, welcome. So I'd like to also give a shout out to uh, people who are helping us behind the scenes. Um, Ryan Boyden and Rebecca Larson of Astronomy on Tap, uh, uh, Austin, Texas are helping out behind the scenes. So thank you so much. We couldn't do it without your help. And um, uh, so, yeah. And so um, we have a lot of great talks for you tonight. So first up, we have Caprice Phillips with down brown dwarfs and super earths, the mysterious in-between objects. And then we have Keyshawn Ivory, who will tell us about improving methods of galactic archaeology. And finally, we'll wrap up with Matthew Murphy's talk, Black and Asher People to Know. All right. So there's three ways you can ask questions. You can ask the speakers questions at any time during their talk. You can post a question in the YouTube chat over to the side of the live feed. You can post a tweet with the hashtag spacedraft 68 or you can comment on the Facebook event for the show. We have people monitoring these channels and they'll pass the questions on to the host who will then ask the speakers these questions at the end of their talk. And if your question doesn't get answered right after the talk, stick around, we'll invite the speakers back at the end of the show for a few more questions. Don't forget to continue to support our friends at Borderlands Brewing, which is our in-person hosting venue. They're such great supporters of our live shows. We love hosting our shows there. We are missing them in this challenging time. I have my own Borderlands beer here tonight in a uh, Borderlands glass. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, I'm enjoying the Noche Dolce from Borderlands. Um, so please uh, don't forget to support them. Um, you can order takeout or delivery at their website. Uh, and don't forget to tip. So you can find information about our show's past, present, and future on Facebook and Twitter, along with our YouTube channel. You can chat, you can connect with us through email at aottucson at gmail.com, and also look at our website and other satellite astronomy on tap venues at astronomyontap.org. If you're not local to Tucson like I am right now, thanks for checking out our show tonight, and I recommend checking out the Astronomy on Tap website to see if there's a satellite show near you. I want to give a, a shout out to Astronomy on Tap ATX in Austin, Texas, who continues to host live shows every month and even some special events. Uh, last night, they had a Ship Builders of Mars special show, which you can still watch the recorded um, show from last night. And next week, week, they will be hosting their own version of live um, Astronomy on Tap. So go ahead and check out those channels for uh, more, more space content. And as a reminder, please be kind and respectful to each other in the comments. Please, please comment, ask questions, and enjoy yourself in the chat, but also remember to be kind and respectful. We do have moderator, moderators who will intervene on inappropriate or disrespectful comments. But So let's enable everyone to enjoy astronomy and science. Right. And with that, let's go ahead and get started. So our first speaker tonight is Caprice Phillips. Uh, Caprice is from Arkansas. Um, she has worked at two national parks, Sequoia Kings Canyon 
in California and Sleeping Bear Dunes National Lakeshore in Michigan. She loves Spider-Man, she loves Back to the Future. In her free time, she likes to cook, hike, and scrapbook. Welcome Caprice, we're so glad you're here. Um, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen. Okay, sorry, one second. Okay. Load. Um, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, just the PowerPoint? Um, no, we can see the presenter view. Okay. Or we can see your notes. Um, I don't know how to. Oh, okay. Wait. Sorry, is my screen. Oh, wait. Sorry. You're okay. Okay. <laughs> Some, some type, amount of technical difficulties <laughs> is expected with these things. <laughs> mm. Okay. Very nice. All right, okay. Caprice, the floor is yours. Okay, so um, thank you guys for introducing me. So um, as Logan said, my name is Caprice Phillips. I'm a graduate student at The Ohio State um, University. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and hers. Um, so today I'm gonna be talking to you guys kind of about um, two different um, Topic. So the first one's going to be super arts, which is what I currently study um, with Dr. G. Wong at OSU. And I'm going to be talking about ground floors, which is um, some objects that I study for my um, master's thesis, which I'm very interested in. Okay. okay, so before I get kind of started talking about super arts, I wanted to start with kind of a, um, a picture that may be more familiar. So what we have here is our solar system. So we have a sun and then we have the first few um, terrestrial planets, inner rocky planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. And then in the middle here, we have um, gas giants, which are Jupiter and Saturn. And towards the end, we have Uranus and Neptune, which are ice giants. So we're all um, familiar with the solar system planets. Um, but one of kind of the um, ongoing question is like, how did these planets form? That's an ongoing um, area of research um, in astronomy. We actually are not quite sure how they actually form. So one of the methods that um, we think uh, that formation happens, one of the theories is something called the core accretion method, which is the um, bottom up approach. So the idea is that we have here, we have um, kind of like a young, a young star and around it is kind of this disk of um, dust grains and uh, gas. And so the idea is that these dust grains are very small, but eventually they will start to interact and collide together. And when that happens, they kind of start sticking, sticking together and building up into bigger and bigger uh, masses. And eventually um, what will happen is that these um, the dust grains will get like these meter sized things and eventually they'll build into the cores of planets of giant planets where they'll get massive enough so that they can actually start to um, their gravity will start to pull in gas around them and form planets like you know like Jupiter and um, the bigger planets so like the smaller planets like Earth and stuff um, will be like the massive pull with a little bit of gas around them so that's um, one of the uh, theories but um, each method kind of have its pros and cons. Kind of some of the drawbacks for this one is that we actually don't know how we get past a certain size that things start to kind of build together. There's a problem with the time scale for um, that this happens. And there are also like questions of like, why doesn't the dust just kind of fling into the star and like become destroyed? So another method that we have a theory of formation is something called the disk instability method which um, is nicknamed the top-down approach. So I kind of have like an illustration here of like a vinyl disc. I guess you're too young, you may not know who you're looking at, but it used to play music if you're not familiar with this, but it's like a vinyl disc, which is kind of to um, simulate like a, a area of like gas and dust like around the star in the center. And so with this method, we have the gas and dust swirling around the star, around the vinyl disc, and then we start to have something where the disc kind of breaks or fragments and it starts to begin to form um, these clumps of material. And so after this, eventually, excuse me, so eventually planets begin to form as it sweeps um, through and begins to pick up gas. And so eventually, um, excuse me, the, um, the planet will start to like 
um, eat the gas um, around it as it sweeps through um, the disk. So this is kind of like the other uh, second main theory for planet formation. So um, kind of on to what um, the main uh, point of the talk is super Earth. So um, if you're not familiar with what a super Earth is, it's this type of exoplanet, which is about 10 to two times more massive um, than Earth. And so what's really interesting about these objects is that we have no solar system analog for these things. There's no type of planet like this found in our solar system. Like the most massive planet is Earth, um, but this one is more massive. And some of the questions are like, why didn't it become like a gas giant, like Jupiter and stuff? Like what stopped it um, from forming like the other planets? So that's kind of like one of the um, areas for like super Earths. So in astronomy um, in general, there are kind of like these um, outstanding um, kind of questions. And some of those are, do other Earths exist? And if they do exist, are they common? Um, and do they have signs of life? And what do these signs of life look like? So um, the Kepler mission um, let us know that like super Earths are actually one of the most common type of exoplanets out there. And so observationally, they're easier to study than um, Earth-sized planets does. They're more massive and they're larger. So it naturally makes them um, easier to look for than an Earth-sized planet. So um, astronomers are gravitating towards super Earths to look for maybe signs of life, like biosignatures and different um, things like that. So um, I mentioned biosignatures. So when we think about life, um, we're, we are naturally inclined to kind of think about life as it exists here on Earth. Um, like we know that the Earth, like this little chart here on the left, like the Earth's atmosphere is made of mostly nitrogen and oxygen, a little water vapor and other gases. And so if kind of an outside observer was to like take an instrument and kind of look um, at Earth and kind of study the atmosphere, like they would see like certain markers um, that may, may be in, indicative that life exists, like the ones I have circled here, like O2, um, carbon dioxide, CO2, kind of methane and another form of dioxide, like things that can be produced by kind of plant life and like different organisms here on Earth. But um, the way that Earth, the way that life presents itself on Earth is not necessarily the case um, for other planets and other super Earths. So one way that we looked at for, um, that we look for planets is something called the transit method of detection. And so that's something that I'm interested in. So eventually the James Webb Space Telescope will launch and it will be really useful for studying super Earth's atmospheres. And with the transit method of detection, what happens is we have a star here indicating yellow and we have the planet here and it will go, it will cross in front of um, the star and we'll go around it and we'll be able to get information like the size of the planet. Um, and so it'll go around like such and then they come around and as it go around the back is something called a secondary eclipse, which can give us um, information about like the thermal emission um, of, of the planet, and, like the stuff in its atmosphere. So we can kind of probe and uh, kind of learn more things about that using this method. And that's what I'm interested in looking in with my advisor with the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. So I mentioned kind of bio signatures before and how they can look different um, from the ones on Earth. So one of the ones that um, we're interested in is ammonia. And so like not this like stinky gas we're used to. So if we think about ammonia, so if you look at a super earth atmosphere, which is not mainly, um, which may not be mainly like nitrogen and oxygen, it could be hydrogen and nitrogen. So if you were to look with an instrument, you look in the atmosphere and you see a signature of ammonia here, this kind of feature here, this red and blue, so if you see that, there may be signs that an organisms um, reacted with the hydrogen and the nitrogen to produce ammonia because um, ammonia won't happen like naturally under like um, temperatures, I think less than a thousand Kelvin. You need something, some organism, some catalyst to produce this. So if you see it, something had to be there to react with the hydrogen and nitrogen to cause the signature that you see. This makes it very interesting um, gas to study. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we're kind of just twiddling our thumbs until the James Webb Space Telescope 
uh, launches. It keeps getting delayed. Life happens, but um, eventually we'll get there. Hopefully it's not like in the year 2060 and I'm retiring um, or tenure, but we'll see. Fingers are crossed. Um, that's just like a little bit about the project that I'm working on right now at OSU. So kind of, um, so kind of switching, kind of switching gears. I'm going to go into talking about um, brown dwarfs and the work that I did for my master's thesis. So we talked a little bit about planets and exoplanets. So now let's get into brown dwarfs. So if you're not familiar with brown dwarfs, um, they're this really, I'm a little biased, but they're these really cool objects. So they kind of lie in this like in between stage. They're too massive to be considered planets, but they're not massive enough to be considered a star like the sun. Like they don't have enough mass to burn like hydrogen into helium like the sun does. And these objects are really interesting, like their brightness and their temperature, like it decreases with time, unlike stars where they have like a steady brightness or luminosity and temperature over millions and billions of years. And so um, some of the ongoing questions with brown dwarfs is like, how do they form? How do they evolve? Like what's the relationship between brown dwarfs and gas giants? And what are some of the atmospheric properties of brown dwarfs? And kind of an interesting uh, backstory about how brown dwarfs are actually named is that there were actually kind of like three other names before. One of the first ones was they like, okay, let's call them black dwarfs. And they abandoned that because a black dwarf is actually the theoretical inline for a white dwarf. So that was already taken. And then they came up and was like, okay, let's do infrared dwarfs. And they're like, no, well, that may not work because infrared applies that you can only like kind of see features in the infrared when in fact we can see features in brown dwarfs in the optical as well. And then there's another name called Lilliputian star that they came up with. And I don't know, that one's just kind of mouthful anyway, which I feel like is the main reason they abandoned it. Um, so eventually, like in 1995, Jill Tarter, she actually coined the term brown dwarf, like in her thesis. And that's what we use today. It's a little history for y'all. Okay, so um, with brown dwarfs, there are these special kind of brown dwarfs called benchmark. Uh, brown dwarfs. And so what these, what, what benchmark brown dwarfs are, they're um, brown dwarfs where we know the age and the luminosity. And that is really important because we need both age and luminosity or brightness to determine or infer mass using evolutionary models. And as I mentioned before, the mass is a cutoff for what you consider a brown dwarf versus a star or a brown dwarf versus a planet. So we want to know what that mass is. So benchmark brown dwarfs are kind of further broken into two subcategories. And the first one is a companion. So if you have a brown dwarf that like orbits a star, if you know the age of the star, you can know the age of the brown dwarf. And like I said, age is something really important um, in astronomy to know. And then another one we have is if it's a part of something called a moving group. So what a moving group is, it's just this collection of, that can be stars, brown dwarfs, planets and they're all moving together with like the same kind of velocities like in space but they can be spread out of the large portions of the sky but they're all moving together collectively as one if you kind of think of you ever seen if you've ever seen like gnats of insects kind of swarming around they're really annoying they're swarming around like in your face and you see they're all kind of clustered together but they, they all seem to be moving in different places but they never leave each other that's like kind of an analogy for what a moving group is um, and what's interesting about an object that I studied was it was a companion to a star, but was also part of a moving group. So it was kind of a double-double kind of thing, which made it very interesting. And um, uh, I was eager to study it. Okay, so um, the object that I studied is kind of has a long name. It's like 2M0443 plus 3723B, which is just the coordinates of it. So kind of some backstory for this object is that um, my past advisor, um, they noticed this object in papers, but they noticed that like no one had really kind of talked about it since it was first introduced in a paper back in 2010. And it seemed to have similar properties to another brown dwarf and this uh, moving group, the Beta Pictoris moving group. And so they were motivated to um, study um, this object, given that it might be similar to another brown dwarf. And so they approached me about working on it, and so the work began. 
And so this actually here on the left is an image I was able to take. I was able to go to the um, Keck, uh, Keck Observatory in Hawaii, and we were doing like a, a series of targets, and we um, had time to image that one. So I got to take a fake picture in front of their real desk set, where, well, where my real setup was just this computer with the notebook there. So um, that was a really fun experience to get to um, take an image of an uh, object that I would be studying. So um, another thing about brown dwarf companions is that they're very, very rare. In fact, there's less than a 5% occurrence rate. There are a lot of brown, like isolated brown dwarfs that are not attached to anything. There's like over a thousand, but there's not that many that are companions that are like orbiting a star or something else, which makes them like um, people want to study them as much as they can when they find one to characterize it. So, for in particular, for the beta pick moving group, um, there's actually only a few uh, brown dwarf companions um, discovered. There's one in 2010, HR7329b. This is here, right here, this little blob on the left, and this is just a star. Um, there's another one that I keep mentioning, it's called PZ tail B, was discovered in 2010 as well. Um, and then there's maybe the object that I studied um, that was also discovered in 2010. And so, um, in just like 20 year span, there's only been two kind of like confirmed brown dwarf companions, just kind of like to illustrate like how rare it is to find these things. So as I started, as I stated before, like when we first started the project, it was like this object that I'm studying and another brown dwarf are very similar. And so we started kind of doing some check, um, check mark for things as I was kind of studying and characterizing it. We know first that they're both moved um, members of the beta pick movement group. They both have similar spectral types or uh, temperatures. Um, PCTLB is actually closer to its star that it's orbiting than the object that I was studying. And mine's is further away, which is actually a good thing because when the object is like too close to the whole star, it kind of becomes like lost in like the glare, the star, and it makes it harder to find and just to characterize and study because like the kind of features start to get um, melded together. But what made this object interesting and different than the other one, um, then PZTL B was that the luminosity for my object was a lot higher than PZTL B. And I'm gonna kind of explain like why I have this sad face for it. So as I mentioned before, you need, in astronomy, you need age and luminosity to kind of infer mass using these models that people have built. And so like what I have here is just like a plot of like age and luminosity. So when we know these two things, we can kind of um, make a point on this plot here. And where the point lies, it will tell us what's the mass of an object. So the red circle here is PZ tail B. And so, you know, given is how bright it is and its age, it says it's about 64 Jupiter masses, which is like the average. Um, but then when we look at my object that I study, it said it was 99 Jupiter masses. Um, and just a reminder, I can't tell if it's blocking, just a reminder is that brown dwarfs, the mass for them is between 13 and 75 Jupiter masses. So 99 is, is like way above 75, which would mean it's in these little blue lines, which would make it a low mass star and not within the orange lines for brown dwarfs, which is really shocking because everything else about these systems are similar. So we ask like, why is the luminosity so different? And because the luminosity is so different, therefore the mass is not the same, which would not make it a brown dwarf. So one of the things we thought about was like, okay, could there be something else um, like another companion with the brown dwarf that could account for its unexpected brightness. You know, two flashlights are brighter than just one flashlight. So we actually looked at and reduced the images from Keck that we took. And when we reduced them, we see this kind of blob-like structure here with the brown dwarf. So we're like, okay, maybe that's a little something, something. Like maybe we found a reason for why it's so luminous. But when we look at, this is an image on the left of the star, you see, hopefully you can see like there's a little blob there too. And so, I mean, it looks visually cool, but the thing is that this blob is like kind of present in both pictures, 
which is a sign that is not special to the Brown Drug Companion. It's in both images, which means it's just kind of an artifact of like um, how it was imaged and like reducing the image, it's something called a speckle, and it's not a companion that's unique to the brown dwarf. So that kind of ruled out that there's a companion that we can at least like visibly see. And so kind of the, the end kind of result for this product, for this research project was that like, we don't really know. So we don't really know like if it's a brown dwarf, is it a star? Could it be a, a binary? If it is a binary, then each uh, separate masses would be a brown dwarf. But if it's just one object, then it would be a star. So that was kind of like one of the ongoing questions we were left with this project. And then we had some other things where we were questioning whether it actually belonged to the moving group in the first place. There were some kind of uh, the numbers weren't matching up to the overall average for the moving group. So that was another thing we kind of ran into. And, and we we're also testing things about if the system was indeed young, because if it doesn't belong to this moving group, we're not sure about the, the age of it. So those are some of the things um, that we looked into this project as well. It was overall kind of a mysterious project, um, but it was really interesting to try to find out the answer for it. But that's what ultimately happens a lot for astronomy research. We're kind of like, I don't know, when we're waiting for like next big instruments to help give us some answers. That's kind of where my project ended for this one. And then I got a paper out of it, which is good. Um, so that's the end of my talk. So thank you guys for listening. I hope you learned something and I hope you got a, had a good time. Thank you. Thank you, Caprice. That was great. Man, I love a good Mean Girls reference. <laughs> and, uh, and you know I love me a brown dwarf. Uh, I really like how your um, talk showed how hard they are to find and then how hard they are to understand. They are so yeah. hard. Um, yeah. I've, you, we've suffered through this together. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that's what makes them interesting, in my opinion. Um, exactly. Yeah, there's so many open questions that we... Uh, we haven't can't haven't found the answer to so they're interesting things, things to study yeah um, yeah so we have a few questions from the audience um <laughs> jasmine would you like to um give yeah. our first question so hmm, I have an so, so yasmin uh asked what would the earth's atmosphere look like to an alien astronomer um so i don't I can't pull up my slides but the Earth's atmosphere, I kind of showed a slide about it, but- you pull up your slides, um, go ahead. Oh, I can pull, okay, let me go. Yeah. Just share your screen again. Share my screen. I left off it. Let me see if I can, sorry, rewind, just pretend we're <laughs> rewinding a VHS, which I guess we don't do that anymore, but. <laughs> Digging deep with records and VHSs. Yeah, nostalgia, man, nostalgia. <laughs> uh, so, um, here I had this pie chart of what the main components of the atmosphere were, but like here is like actually what um, the atmosphere of Earth uh, looks like. I forgot which instrument it was, but that's not really the main point, but this is just kind of some of the spectral features of certain um, kind of mole molecular like fingerprints of things that are present in the atmosphere. So like um, along the way, like in the infrared, they would see things like uh, methane, and they would also see like maybe some water vapor, and also like O3 and like carbon dioxide. So these ones I have circled here, and even the ones I don't are some of the things that like an alien observer, they have the technology to observe Earth, to like do this, this is like what they, what it would, uh, what it would look like. Thanks. So can you tell us um, what is the major differences between a hot Jupiter and a brown dwarf? Um, so I don't really study high Jupiters, but a high Jupiter, just from like what I know, like they're, they're very warm. They're super hot. That's like in the name, like brown dwarfs. I mean, they're not planets, like hot Jupiters are planets, like brown dwarfs are brown dwarfs and they're not uh, <laughs> planets. So they're probably like, they're not going to have the same kind of, uh, spectral features. Like the temperature is going to look different. I think probably the surface gravity is gonna look different between hot Jupiters and brown dwarfs, but that's kind of my limited knowledge because I don't study uh, brown dwarfs. I just kind of look at like super herbs and stuff. But that's a good question though. Yeah, thanks for asking. Okay. Uh, have we detected any ammonia outside Earth yet? No, we haven't. 
So we're looking, hopefully, like I said, when, um, if it will, it will launch. I'm speaking that and the truth right now, when James Webb launches eventually, it will be able to kind of look at super Earth's atmosphere and look for these things. Like there's no guarantee we will find it, but it has like the capabilities and like the resolution and stuff to look for that uh, feature there among it. But we haven't found it yet, but we're looking, we want to. So. Uh, great. Um, so you talked about how brown dwarfs are not the same as planets. Can a brown dwarf have a planet? Actually, actually, yes, they can. Sorry, there was a, a paper that astronomer, uh, sorry, I got really excited. There's an astronomer, um, Trent Dupuis, like actually in the Beta Pit Moving Group, there's actually these two brown dwarfs that orbit each other. And he found a planet really, really, really far away that orbits these two brown dwarfs. Like brown dwarfs are totally cool. They can like host planets. They can like be companions. They're kind of all over the place, which makes it very neat. Nice. So yes, the answer to the question is yes. One last very important question. What is your favorite national park and why? Hmm. Um, okay. I actually, so it's actually Sequoia. I mean, I'm, I'm from a national park, so I probably shouldn't say Sequoia, but I think it's Sequoia because this past summer that I was there, like I got to go like look at the night sky and it was totally dark. I was creeped out, but it was very nice out there. And like the night sky was just like nothing else I'd ever seen before. So that's just for like that reason alone, besides being terrified that it was like super dark, which is ironic. It was like very cool to see and just kind of like be out there. So I'd say Sequoia is my favorite. That's great. Thank mm -hmm. you. All right, can you, if you can stop your screen share. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks Caprice. That was really, really great. So another round of applause. For Caprice, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. So next up, so our next speaker is Keyshawn Ivory. And so a little bit about our next speaker, before pursuing a master's at Fisk, Keyshawn got a BA in astronomy and French studies from Rice University. During that time, he joined the American Astronomical Society Site Visit Oversight Committee, helping to establish protocol for astronomy departments nationwide to, to request site visits to assess their climate inclusivity. He also served on the search committee for the Association of Universities for Research and Astronomy's Chief Diversity Officer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Outside of class, Keyshawn travels around Nashville, bringing the stars to local students with a traveling planetarium. Oh, that sounds really neat. Beyond space, he loves to write and has also always loved singing, arranging, and sometimes even composing music. So without further ado, go ahead and share your screen and you can get started. Awesome. Hello, everybody. All right. Sure. Boom. Just like that. Okay. Um, hopefully everybody can see everything. So hello again. Uh, my name is Keyshawn Ivory. I'm going to talk about improving methods of galactic archaeology. Um, this is actually some research that I did when I was an undergrad. Right now I'm a grad student in the Fisk Vanderbilt Bridge Program in Nashville, Tennessee. But this I did with Professor Charlie Conroy and Dr. Phil Cargyle, uh, who are both at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. So old stuff, but super interesting stuff. Okay, so um, you're probably wondering what galactic archeology span actually is. Um, I know I didn't know what it was when I started working on it. So if you think about, hold on, there we go, if you think about uh, like human archaeology, I guess the social science, like regular archaeology. The goal there is to use artifacts in order to establish a chronology or learn more about past societies, human societies, um, and to try to understand how they lived and establish a chronology for a certain place or a certain time. And so it's kind of as an example of that, like a visual metaphor. Uh, here I have a picture of a pyramid at Chichen Itza in the Yucatan in Mexico. Um, but you can see it's got like a modern light display projected on it. So that's my way of saying that archeology span now is kind of about using modern tools and modern methods to uncover more about like the ancient world. Uh, because these indigenous societies, they're not gone, right? A lot of indigenous people are still, are still here and we wanna know more about their history. So galactic archeology span then along that same vein is trying to use our you know, modern astronomy tools to uncover more about the formation of 
the Milky Way. So this is obviously not a picture of our Milky Way because we're kind of in it. So you can't really look at it from the outside like that. But this is just to show you kind of what the Milky Way structure is like. And I'll refer back to this a little bit later when I'm telling you about the part of the Milky Way that we were interested in studying. So basically galactic archeology span is about trying to figure out how the Milky Way formed and why it is the way that it is now. So the way that we actually get at this question of how the Milky Way formed, uh, at least the way my advisor was trying to tackle it is with this survey called the H3 survey. So the three H's are stellar halo at high resolution with hectoshell. Uh, so one by one, halo is just an area, it's a, it's a region of the galaxy. So referring back here, uh, the arms, the spiral part, that's all in what's called the disc, which is the thin, like flat, sort of plain part of the galaxy. Um, the fuzzy part in the middle, we call that the bulge because it is kind of like a spherical bulge in the center. Um, the halo, you can't really see it all at once because it's kind of everything else. It's the big spherical area that kind of surrounds the galaxy. It's everything above the disk, everything below the disk. It kind of envelops the whole thing. And so for this survey, we were interested in the stars out there and figuring out how the halo kind of assembled, why it looks like that, what those populations look like. High resolution means exactly what you think it means. It's just like a television or something. It just means able to like resolve a lot of fine detail. And I'll talk in a minute about the specific data inputs that I'm talking about resolving. And then finally, Hectoshell is just the name of an instrument. It's the name of the spectrograph that uh, this survey used. And when I was doing this research, the survey hadn't actually started yet. Now it's been running for a few years, but when I was doing this in 2017, it was still about to begin in, in the fall. And this was the summer. So the question of what properties of stars we even use, what are we even interested in, in trying to find out how the halo was assembled? We're interested in things like temperature, rotational velocity, you know, how fast the stars are spinning out there, uh, metallicity, which is just the presence of elements heavier than like helium, uh, surface gravity, which is the gravity at the surface of the star, um, all these things tell us a bit about what stars might have formed together in the same clouds uh, and, and essentially like knowing which stars kind of formed together might tell us how the halo assembled at large. Sure. But I have a particular property marked and that's radial velocity. And that's important because if you refer to this diagram, I'm going to help you kind of explain, I'm going to help you kind of understand why that's so important. Sure. So the gray thing is Earth. And uh, we're there for better or for worse. I don't know, you know, for how long, but we're there. Um, and then the yellow thing is the star. You can, it doesn't matter what star, it's not drawn to scale. Don't worry about that. It could be the sun, you know, pick your favorite star. It's that one. Um, so you see three axes, X, Y, and Z. So X and Y form what's called proper motion. And that's something that we, you know, we look out from earth, we can see that in the sky. We measure the position of a star one night, we come back sometime later, measure it again. It's, oh, it's somewhere different. It moved and we can, we can measure that pretty directly by using position. But that Z component is radial velocity. So if the star moves along your line of sight, like backwards or forwards, that's not something you're gonna be able to see by measuring position because it's already a little tiny dot in the sky, right? If it gets further, you're not really gonna see it get smaller. It's already so small. And so for that, we actually have to look to the star's light. And I'll talk a bit about how we do that in a second. But the reason why that's so important is because it's like that crucial final dimension that tells us about how these stars are moving. So once we have that, we can actually figure out, okay, which stars might've really formed out of the same clouds in the same space? And how did the halo really come to be what it is now? So about how we look at that light, this is a spectrum. And maybe, you know, you've probably seen something like this before. It's just on one axis, you've got uh, color. So all the different wavelengths of, of light. And then on the other axis, you've got intensity, which is just like how much of that light you're getting. And so you can see all these little dips, right? And above, you can see different kinds of hydrogen, H alpha and H beta and H gamma that each have their own little signature. 
And those little dips are how we know which elements are present. So you can get so much information out of the spectrum by looking at the width of the dip, the, uh, the, the broadness of the dip, by looking at the exact position of the dip. You can get all that velocity information, uh, temperature information, so much information. But the issue is that it's kind of expensive. I mean, you really have to collect a lot of light and you have to have your telescope trained on the same thing for a while. And so what if there was a way to get some of this information, but to do so more quickly and in a way that's more cheap? What if you could just take this light and kind of bin it into filters? So you can see there, there's uh, ultraviolet, blue. V is like visible, but it's more like greenish. R for red. And there's also infrared, but you can't really see it in this plot, but it's past red, obviously. So if you take, instead of, wavelength by wavelength by wavelength, you take it and you bend it into these filters, it's so much faster, so much cheaper, takes so much less time. You do lose some information along the way, but you still get a lot of really helpful information. And so that is called photometry. And the, the information you get out is a spectral energy distribution or an SED, which I'm gonna refer to as SED from now on. And so the way that I like to think of it, honestly, is like, if the spectrum, the full spectrum, is like going to the doctor and getting your checkup, your complete checkup, photometry is then like going and just getting your vitals taken. So you miss some information, but it's so much faster, so much cheaper. And if something's really, really wrong, like you'll probably, you'll probably know. So the code that I worked with uh, called the pain, named after Cecilia Payne Kaposchkin, who is a famous uh, astrophysicist who was at Harvard you know, a long, long time ago, and she studied spectra. Uh, this code fits both SED and spectra, so both uh, just the vitals and also the full checkup. And the way that it does that, I'm going to explain it to you the way that a very nice man, Dr. Phil Cargyle from Fort Worth, Texas, explained it to me. I went back to visit him last summer, um, and he had his hair in the most amazing bun. It's not relevant at all to the, to the research, but I thought you should know. Um, I'm going to explain this the same way he did to me. So the way the paint actually works is Professor Conroy is like some brilliant magic wizard man. And he has made this grid of models called C3K, which is just for some combination of properties, temperatures, uh, metals, velocities. It's a model of what the SED should look like and what the spectrum should look like. And the code trains, it trains on that grid of models and it learns the patterns and eventually it learns to read in between the lines. That's deep learning. So that you feed it real data and then based on what it knows, it can fill in the blanks and it can say, okay, based on what I've been trained on, I think the temperature is probably this. The metallicity is probably that. And so that combo of models and deep learning uh, makes up the pain. And that's the code that I worked with. So the question that emerged naturally uh, kind of throughout this process was what do we gain from fitting both the spectra and the SED, the full checkup and just the vitals. What's the benefit of doing both at the same time when we're looking for these properties? And so before I can answer that question, there's one last thing that you have to understand about the code. And that's the statistics that make it work. So we call that ensemble Markov chain Monte Carlo. And I assure you, it is extremely exciting. Okay, and so word by word, we're gonna kind of break it down. So ensemble, that just means a bunch. So the goal of, of Ensemble Markov Chain Monte Carlo is to sample the entire space of parameters. So all of these different combinations of temperature, metallicity, velocity, whatever parameters you choose to look for, all the possible combinations, we want to explore the probability of every combination of those things. So we're trying to sample an entire space. And so ensemble just means we have a lot of individual, we call them walkers, and those are the little entities that sample the space. We sent out, I think there are 300 in, in the paint, 300 walkers kind of sample the space, which breaks down the process, makes it faster, otherwise it would take forever. Markov chain, means forgetfully ambling about. So that's kind of the core of what makes this work. So essentially every walker 
uh, is trying to sample the space and it does so by evaluating the probability at some other point and saying, if that probability is higher, I'm gonna go over there. And if it's not, I'm gonna stay where I am. The thing is, I say forgetfully because once it moves, it forgets all information about where it's been. So it could end up in the exact same place again. And sometimes it even gets stuck. And I always say that this is kind of a terrible way to live, but a really great way to sample when you forget where you've been and only think about where you're going. So that's the kind of the core of how this works. And then finally, Monte Carlo is like gambling. So it just means random. So there's some element of each walker's walk that is random. It could be the length of the step, how far it takes a step when it decides to move in a direction. And uh, that's, that's like what we did, but just it means some element of randomness is present during the sample. So all of that understood, now we can talk about the results. So this looks like a lot, but it's really not. We're gonna step through it quickly because what's about to happen is I'm gonna show you the plots, I'm gonna show you the results, and I want you to know what to look at. So the plots I'm gonna show you are called corner plots, and they're just to help you visualize the distribution of likelihood for the chosen parameters. So it's just a plot of where the probability is highest, lowest, et cetera. Um, you're gonna see four different values of signal to noise. So I inserted random noise into these models in order to see if I could recover the values that I put in as truth. That's how I know my model's working or my, my code is working. So you're gonna see four different values and we're gonna take it from the cleanest data to the messiest data, noisiest data. So the highest value of signal to noise to the lowest. Um, and they're spaced out like 100 to, to two. The parameters that I chose for us to look at are temperature and metallicity. So the temperature obviously is how hot it is. Metallicity, the presence of elements heavier than helium. Um, I mentioned just now, I put truths in, I added data to see, or noise to see if I could recover those truths. The truths, just so you know, were 5770 Kelvin, which is the sun's temperature roughly, and zero metallicity, metallicity which is the sun's metallicity. Uh, so yes, I did use solar inputs and added noise, and I'm trying to recover solar inputs. Uh, so what we're actually gonna be looking at is a contour plot. So the in the crosshairs, there's gonna be an intersection and that's where my truths are. And whether those crosshairs fall in the contour is a measure of accuracy. And the size of the contour is how precise it is. And finally, you're gonna see two kinds of plots that are laid on top of each other. Blue is just the spectrum. So that's the checkup. Red is the SED and the spectrum. The checkup and the vitals, the checkup and the physical. So with all that said, now we can look at the plots. So reviewing one more time. Blue is for just the spectrum, so that's the checkup. This is the highest signal to noise, which is the cleanest data. And we're looking at the contour plot on the bottom left. So you can see in the intersection of the crosshairs, it's within the contour. So that means the truth is somewhere in our likely region. Uh, so the accuracy is fine. And if you compare this to, this is incorporating the SED, there's not actually a lot of difference, right? That's kind of to be expected because when the data is this clean, the spectrum dominates. And so the SED doesn't really add or take away anything. So it kind of looks the same. So to really get the effect, we kind of have to make the data more noisy. So we're gonna drop the signal to noise now to 38. So looking again at just the spectrum and looking again, the bottom left is the contour. The intersection of the crosshairs, which are the truths, are well within the darkest region, which is the most likely region. So the accuracy is fine. Um, the precision leaves much to be desired. It's kind of a big contour. Not a big difference uh, because the signal to noise is still quite high. So in order to see the difference, we need to make our data even noisier. So we're gonna drop it all the way to five. Okay. So the intersection of the crosshairs is a little bit outside of our likely region. So the accuracy is not great. Uh, precision is not amazing. This is a really big difference. 
the intersection of the crosshairs is within the likely region and the size of the contour itself is so much smaller, meaning that our, our results are more precise. So in this case, with quite noisy data, incorporating the SED as well as the spectrum, or in other words, doing the full checkup plus the vitals or just or plus the physical was beneficial because we got an increase in both accuracy and precision in measuring our temperature and our metallicity. And so finally, the noisiest data I plotted is signal to noise two. And this is around the regime where the actual data coming out of the H3 survey is. So you can see a really big contour. So it's not super precise, but it is pretty accurate. It's kind of right in the crosshairs or right in the center. But if you go down to incorporating both the spectrum and the SED, you really, really shrink the size of that contour. So it gets a lot more precise and it's pretty dead accurate. Only thing is there's kind of a secondary uh, peak, which maybe a walker got stuck somewhere. I'm not really sure about that, but um, the, the main peak is exactly where it needs to be and it's nice and tight. So incorporating the SED is pretty helpful uh, for the more noisy data. So kind of a recap, incorporating the SED and the spectrum increased accuracy and precision uh, mostly precision though, of our measurements of stellar parameters, temperature and metallicity. Um, accuracy just means closer to the truths and precision is uh, more trustworthy results with smaller uncertainties. And this effect was uh, really exacerbated for noisier data. So very, very briefly, I mentioned that this is kind of old work. Now I am a grad student um, at Fisk and my research is uh, with Professor Andreas Berlin at Vanderbilt. So I'm gonna talk very briefly about what I do now. So this whole thing was about a galaxy, our galaxy. If you kind of zoom out like quite a bit, galaxies organize themselves into galaxy clusters, which are these gravitationally bound structures, the largest ones that we have in the universe. Um, and those, just as the individual galaxy is surrounded by a stellar halo, those clusters of galaxies are surrounded by a halo of matter that we can't actually see, but we know that it's there because of things like gravity, and that's called dark matter. So there's one central galaxy, which is the main galaxy in the halo, and there's smaller satellite galaxies that surround it. And so my code that I'm working on now is figuring out how to assign a mass to the dark to the entire dark matter halo and organize galaxies into these galaxy clusters, these galaxy groups by centrals and satellites using information like the mass of the central galaxy and the uh, the velocities of the central and the satellites. So that's what I do now. It's just like I've moved on from stellar halos to dark matter halos. So much larger scale, large scale structure. Um, and yeah, that's that's the end. So I'll happily take any questions anybody has. All right, thank you so much. That was a good introduction into galactic archaeology. I'd heard of it, but hadn't didn't really know what it entailed before. Yeah, same. Before I did this, like literally <laughs> same. <laughs> also, the H three explanation slide where you had the not steel star it reminded me of the super Earth, which was a oh yeah accidental effect <laughs> to the last. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I also had to fit models to SCDs. Mine wasn't as advanced, but it was neat to learn about a different method slash code and also gave me mild flashbacks, but that's <laughs> so, uh, that. I guess going into questions, Logan, you want yeah. to start? Um, sure. So, um, first of all, did I hear a little dog in the background there? Oh my God, literally. I'm at my parents' house in Dallas and they have this dog. His name is Chase. He's in there. Oh my gosh, he chose the right time, the wrong time to act up, but it's okay. <laughs> you know, that's we're used to that by now with these uh, Zoom calls. It's just daily life now. <laughs> um, exactly. So I have a question. Uh, do we know about, what do we know about satellite galaxies in our own galaxy? And what do they tell us about our galaxy's dark matter halo? Right. Um, so the best examples that kind of come to mind are like the Magellanic clouds, large and small. Um, they, there's, this is something that my, one of my old, old advisors from like 2016 used to work on was uh, 
like the, the stripping of matter, we call it like title stripping of like matter in interactions between the, the Milky Way and these really, really tiny sort of clouds out there. Um, and the kind of a violent word to use, but like the cannibalization uh, slowly as the Milky Way like takes in more of that gas. Um, so that's kind of the best examples that come to mind of like satellites. And in this, in this case, we're kind of like eating them sort of slowly. Um, as far as what that tells us about the dark matter halo, um, I'm not really sure because most of the studies I've ever read about the Magellanic clouds are more about exactly this, the tidal stripping and what that tells us about star formation rates or like quenching or all these, which is like when stars stop forming, all these things that we kind of don't understand very well. Um, and so it is, it is my sense that we're using our own Milky Way to kind of learn more about galaxy dynamics in terms of what we can see, like normal matter, and we're turning more to like farther away things to get a sense of like dark matter, or in my case, like completely hypothetical things, because I'm literally just, I, it's a code. I mean, these halos in, in my research now, they kind of exist inside my computer. Or I could take real data, but I when I run my code on it, I'm using basically like math, like equations that we've come up with either like empirically through study to fit halos to them. Uh, so I guess my answer is that learning more about dark matter takes us from that very well-defined, totally empirical regime into something that's kind of based more in like theory or simulation. Nice. Would the pain be able to would it work for dark matter also? That's a really interesting question. Um, so in my time, I kind of ran the pain both backwards and forwards. So uh, it's designed such that you give it spectra and SEDs and it runs the whole MCMC process that I talked you through. And it spits out those corner plots or, or at least the data that corresponds to those corner plots for where is my whatever parameters you want, temperature, metallicity, where is it most likely, least likely. You can run it the other way, which I ended up doing to kind of make the mock data where you give it inputs. I used solar inputs. So all of the sun, I basically took a solar spectrum, added some you know, noise to it, put in what I know the truths to be for the sun, and then it's back back out at me like it's its version of a spectrum. Um, so that's kind of the other way around. As far as what types of inputs or outputs you might expect from dark matter, that's actually a really good question. Um, I don't know that it could work for that only because the way that we define dark matter halos is super, super briefly, right? There's kind of like two ways you can do it by and both of them arise from simulations. So you could do it by looking at a simulation and you have like dark matter particles where your simulation needs to kind of break it down into like particles to, to run. And so you could look at proximity of those particles and then say, okay, if you're within this linking length, that's a halo, like that's a group, right? Um, another way to do it is with like this over density idea. So you just say, I'm going to draw a circle and where where the overdensity compared to the rest of the universe stops being let's say 200 times the density of like the rest of the universe that's the boundary between my halo and everything outside and that's a pretty common uh, a definition and there's a way that my code is doing it which is using sort of analytical equations that already exist and then using the galaxies themselves I don't know that the pain, the way that it's built right now and any of the 19 things that it takes in to do what it does, I don't know that it is really built for dark matter type stuff. Great. Um, one more question. Uh, this one's from Yazwant. Um, are galactic archaeology techniques more focused on our own galaxy or can we apply them to other galaxies too? Mm, good question. Um, in my experience, most people are interested in the Milky Way um, because I mean, for practical purposes, that's the one that we can get the most sort of hands-on when we measure, we can get the most information about stars 
in the Milky Way because they're right here. Yeah, um, and yeah. so for the purpose of trying to uncover that chronology of how it might have formed, we te- I think we tend to focus on the Milky Way. But the end goal, of course, is to understand on a more broad scale galaxy formation kind of in general, or at least spiral galaxy formation kind of in general, because the structure of the Milky Way is of course not unique. Like many spirals have, of course they have the arms, which is like in the disc, and then many of them have a bulge and then the halo, like it's a very common thing. So if we can sort of nail down what happens in our galaxy to make that happen, that does sort of naturally lead to a better understanding of galaxy formation and evolution at large. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to resolve individual stars in faraway galaxies, right? Exactly. <laughs> Makes sense. <laughs> All right. Um, I just have to say, Keyshawn, uh, very brave of you to talk about MCMC and corner plot <laughs> public talk. Uh, my hat's off to you for that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and you did an, an excellent job. So um, let's thank, thank you, you so much. One more time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, and our last speaker tonight is Matthew Murphy. Uh, Matthew Murphy is an incoming graduate student at uh, Air- University of Arizona Stewart Observatory. Um, and he did his undergrad at Stony Brook University. And he's in the process of moving out here to Tucson to join us. Um, He did planetary dynamics work in undergrad, and he intends to study exoplanets and atmospheres here at Stewart. Um, And outside of work, he loves to play music and playing cards. Take it away, Matthew. Thank you, Logan. Thank you, Jasmine. I am coming to you guys with a really good sour cherry ale, um, which is unfortunately not from Borderlands. Uh, Would love to be there, but um, as we all know, we're nearly half a year into fighting a pandemic, but that pandemic has really brought forth the importance of recognizing science and all of its brave and hardworking people, not just in healthcare, but in all fields of science and academia, including astronomy. But despite this and going back years and years, so many amazing black scientists and their work are too often forgotten or unrecognized. So tonight we're gonna change that. Um, Let me, I forgot to share my screen. I apologize. My name is Matthew Murphy and tonight I would like to introduce you to six awesome people. I'll tell you a little bit about them and what they work on. So we just had a really great talk by the galactic archeologist Keyshawn. So I figured it would be only fitting to kick this talk off by introducing you guys to another really cool galactic archeologist. Keith Hawkins. Dr. Hawkins is currently an assistant professor at UT Austin, and you can check him out at his website or go check out his Twitter at A Galactic Hawk. Uh, Keith does some really cool things and is dedicated to science outreach. He's involved with public observing events and has given outreach talks to all kinds of students and the public. Uh, Back in 2013, he developed a two day workshop for middle and high school students in Athens, Ohio called Demystifying the Science Fair, where he encouraged these students to go and compete in science fairs. Uh, Dr. Hawkins is also deeply interested in mentoring and encouraging minorities and underrepresented students in STEM. And during a stint he did at Cambridge, he participated in their Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic Summer Program, where he gave talks to teenage students on galactic archeology span and the life of a young astronomer. So as I mentioned, he's a galactic archeologist, which we kind of know a little bit more about now. He studies how galaxies form and evolve and specifically what the structure of our own galaxy, the Milky Way is and how they came to be. Instead of digging up tools and bones, Dr. Hawkins and his team use fossil stars to piece together the nature of our Milky Way. Using survey data, right now they're putting together a 3D map of the galaxy and its chemistry using more than 100,000 stars. And you can see a really cool example of this on the bottom left here, which is a still from a video that you can find on his website. It shows an artist's impression of the galaxy overlaid with a real map where each of these tiny little points here is an individual star and they're color coded to reflect the chemical composition. So this map vividly shows how stellar compositions change as you move throughout the galactic disk. And he doesn't just stop at 
mapping these stars, but also studies how they evolve in time. Stars spend the majority of their time burning hydrogen into helium. And over time, the helium builds up in the core more and more. And hydrogen continues to burn in a shell around it until it gets hot enough that this helium ignites. There is a particular group of helium burning stars known as red clump stars. And these are super interesting because they all burn at roughly the same brightness, like a really reliable flashlight. So they're really good for measuring cosmic distances. But of course, there's always a problem. And the problem is that how do you tell these helium burning stars from slightly less evolved hydrogen shell burning stars? Well, Dr. Hawkins and his team came up with a really clever indirect way. On the right here, we have spectra from both the red clump stars and the less evolved hydrogen shell burning stars, where this red curve is the spectra from the red clump star. And what they found is that at certain uh, features in their spectra, particularly these CN features, they distinguish pretty well. So you can really easily tell the difference between them um, when otherwise it'd be really hard to do. And you can learn a lot more about Dr. Hawkins' research at his website, or like I said, find him on Twitter at a Galactic Hawk. Next up, we have Dr. Dara Norman, who is now the Deputy Director of the Community Science and Data Center at the National Optical Infrared Astronomy Research Laboratory there in beautiful Tucson, Arizona. Um, as far as I could see, she's not on Twitter or social media, but you can still check out her work online. She was the first black woman to receive a PhD in astronomy from the University of Washington, and since then has gone to do some really amazing things, including being a diversity advocate for the NOAO, where she works on recruitment and retention initiatives for minorities and women in STEM. She also served as a member of the AAS Committee on the Status of Minorities in Astronomy. Um, she's really committed to inclusion in science and improving access to scientific resources. And even back in 2015, she helped organize the very first inclusive astronomy meeting with the AAS. Dr. Norman studies quasars, which are very bright centers of galaxies, and how something called magnification bias affects our view of the distant universe. When we look at a faraway galaxy, sometimes there's a lot of other matter between us and it, and this intervening mass causes the background light to be gravitationally lensed. And this is known as magnification bias, and it can make galaxies appear larger, um, brighter, or more separated than they actually are. So it has a huge impact on our perception of the distribution of background quasars and needs to be characterized in order to understand and correct for it. So Dr. Norman and her team observed 90 quasars and found evidence of this magnification bias. This figure down at the left here um, shows the degree of correlation between foreground matter and background quasars on different scales. These solid and dashed curves are what we'd expect from uh, what we think magnification bias would be. And as you can see, these cross looking things are the data points which fit amazingly on this curve. This photo on the right here is a Hubble image of a galaxy and this very bright region in the center is what we call a quasar. Now, galaxies don't just host quasars, but as we saw with Dr. Hawkins and Keith Kishan, they also host a lot of stars. And just from the color of a galaxy, you can tell whether or not there is active star formation going on or at least get an idea of whether or not it is actively forming stars. So bluer galaxies are typically associated with ongoing star formation. And there's a question of whether or not this star formation is at all associated or relevant to um, the processes that drive these quasars. So using public data, uh, Dr. Norman and her team looked at a certain type of galaxy known as an LRG and their survey revealed a correlation between nearby quasars and the bluer LRGs. And they suggested that this correlation could indicate that the active star formation in these blue LRGs could be related to the mechanisms that trigger these quasars. You can learn a lot more about the details of her work and her other outreach work 
you can find her online at several different websites. Uh, continuing the focus on collective, nu collective nuclei, uh, next up we have Jedida Eisler, um, who is currently an assistant professor at Dartmouth University. Uh, you can check out her website here or at Jedida Eisler PhD on Twitter. She was the first black woman to receive a PhD in astrophysics from Yale. And just like Dara has gone on to do really great things since then. She has appeared many times on TV and radio, including um, Science Channel's How the Universe Works and the Nat Geo miniseries Mars. Um, she is a senior TED fellow and her TED talks have over two and a half million views online. She's a powerful advocate is the founder of Vanguard STEM and the STEM En Route to Change Foundation, both of which are dedicated to inclusivity and the empowerment of women of color in STEM. And her efforts and outreach really have not gone unnoticed um, as The Root Magazine named her one of the 100 most influential African-Americans. As I mentioned, Dr. Eisler studies active galactic nuclei and in particular blazars which are the hyperactive black holes at the centers of some galaxies that emit huge relativistic jets. Uh, for example, this photo on the left here shows the M87 galaxy, and this long blue streak here is the jet being fired out of the center of the galaxy at light speeds, which is incredible. Um, the physical mechanisms behind these jets aren't totally understood, so Dr. Eisler is working to uncover this mystery using observations to narrow down the gamma emitting regions. And by doing this, she hopes to be able to identify what mechanisms are dominant and what is really driving this jet. Turns out there are two main types of blazars, uh, which differ in the luminosity of their jet, as well as the peak frequencies at which they emit. And historically, the color of a blazar has been associated with it falling under one of these two types. For example, one type um, gets bluer when it gets brighter and the other type gets redder when it gets brighter. And historically, this um, set of two color types have historically been taken as the quote unquote typical behavior of blazars, despite many, many exceptions having been observed. So Dr. Eisler is at the forefront of investigating these variations and these exceptions. And what she has found is that the variations in color are a result of the varying contributions from both the jet and the disk of all that hot gas that surrounds the black hole in the center of the galaxy. Um, this is represented in this figure here to the right, which is from, from one of her papers. Uh, it turns out that the gas around the black hole is inherently bluer. And when it gets hotter, it gets bluer. And the jet is often inherently redder. Well, this is actually for one blazer in particular but can be, or she's working on generalizing the study to several others. And it turns out that the continuous variation between these red and blue ver contributions are what drive the atypical behaviors that are often seen. And you can check out more of Dr. Eisler's work on her website or at her Twitter, as I've mentioned. Next up, I'd like to talk about the late Mercedes Richards. She was a professor and assistant head at Penn State, but unfortunately passed away in 2016. But over the course of her career, uh, Dr. Richards taught all over the world and did some incredible things. In 2006, she was a member of the International Astronomical Union meeting where they made the unfortunate decision to demote Pluto. Um, she was born in Jamaica and in 2008 was awarded the Musgrave Medal in gold by the Institute of Jamaica which is their highest and most prestigious academic prize. In 2011, she organized the first international meeting between binary star researchers in Slovakia. And later that year was even awarded a Fulbright award which, with which she continued her work in teaching in Slovakia. Dr. Richards has also served on many other astronomical committees, including being a president of Commission 42 of the IAU. Dr. Richards was really a pioneer in her field of research, which was the application of tomography to studying binary stars. Tomography is a technique for displaying the cross-section of some object using x-rays or ultrasound. 
and for a long time was really only ever used in the medical field. Uh, for example, as you can see on the left here, tomography is generally what they use to study brains and cross sections of brains. Dr. Richards was the very first to apply this in astronomy, specifically to study the flow of gas between binary star systems. Using tomography, uh, she could observe the binary system and its motion relative to the Earth and then slice the system up to study exactly how gas flows between the stars. So with these cross sections, one can improve and verify physical models and study how gravity and magnetism operate and interact in these systems. And that's exactly what's shown here on this right plot, which was from one of our papers. Um, you got one star kind of in the middle here. This funny looking blob is the companion star. And all of these contours around are how the gas is flowing between and around these binary stars. Now on top of this, in fact, Dr. Richards was among the very first to create 3D movies of systems that exchange mass in order to gain clues on exactly how this process works. All in all, Dr. Richards was a pioneer in many different ways. And you can read more about her life and her work online. She has a really great Wikipedia page and has had many well-written articles about her. Next up, we're gonna meet a really inspiring young astrobiologist. Catherine Cephas is currently a molecular biology grad student um, here at the University of Arizona who focuses on astrobiology and the origins of life. And I'd invite you to check out her LinkedIn. And you can also check her out on Twitter at Catherine underscore Cephas. Despite being very early in her career, Catherine has done some amazing things as everyone has in this talk. Uh, she's involved with the University of Arizona students for the exploration and development of space, as well as the Marine Awareness and Conservation Society She's a moderator at saganet.org, which stands for the Social Action for a Grassroots Astrobiology Network. And they've got a really cool site that in, I'd invite you to check out. And all of her efforts have also earned her a lot of praise, um, including being a blue marble young scientist. And she's also uh, the University of Arizona's NASA Space Grant Ambassador. Astrobiology is a field that's concerned with the origins and evolution of life and how it might be distributed throughout the universe. And of course, this always brings up the question of, well, where is it? Um, which is something that Catherine set out to investigate by studying what's called the galactic habitable zone, which is the region of space in any galaxy, but more specifically our own, where life would be most likely to develop. The origins of life depend on certain molecules being present that act as building blocks. One of these being methanol, which is important for building things like sugars and amino acids that are essential to life as we know it. Catherine surveyed 17 molecular clouds out in the outer regions of our galaxy to see if methanol was present. And it turns out that it sure is, as over 82% of these clouds had methanol. As you can see in this histogram down to the lower left, where these green bars represent the different molecular clouds that she studied. And the ones kind of outlined in this dotted blue line are the ones that tested positive for methanol. Now, even if we were to someday measure signatures of alien life and biology, particularly if it were at an early stage of its evolution, it would be pretty hard to interpret and understand it fully without a solid understanding of how our own life here on Earth evolved. Um, currently, Catherine is working in the Kakar Microbiology Lab here at Arizona on a project to do just that, to uncover the secrets of the origins of life here on Earth. She's focusing on the sequence of proteins, which are hard to pronounce, but I believe it's proterohodopsin, trying to reconstruct the protein sequences and their ancestral behaviors to study how they were back in time and how they evolved to today. And with this work, she hopes to, to paint a picture of what life looked like millions of years ago. And again, you can check out her LinkedIn, her Twitter at Catherine Cephas, and many articles online. Our final highlight tonight is the amazingly talented Moya McTeer, a graduate student at Columbia University. 
Um, she has a really great website to go check out. And you can also find her on Twitter at Go Astro Mo. Moya is a really accomplished science communicator, having given over 100 public and private talks already, including being featured on MSNBC, NPR, and so much more. And she even designed an exhibit for the New York Hall of Science, which turned out to be like a really crazy planet themed escape room. Um, and beyond just the hard science, Moya combines her science and creativity in world building and creating fantasy worlds. She's even written her own science fiction novel named Lying Hordes, which you can check out on her website. Uh, she's also the host of the Exolore podcast, which is a show about science-based world building, imagining what life would be like on strange, quirky alien exoplanets, and in the end, appreciating how special our own little planet is. Moya has tried her hand in several different subfields of astronomy, including some really great work with exoplanets and galactic chemistry. Um, in addition to the cool and wacky worlds that she has built, over 4,000 exoplanets have been discovered to date in our galaxy. And many of them were discovered and studied as Caprice mentioned with the transit method, which looks at the dip in brightness as a planet passes in front of its star. With current technology, we're able to study the planet's shadow and get an idea of what's in its atmosphere, but we are unable to get a glimpse of what the planet's surface might look like and really won't be able to until the next generation of telescopes comes online. But once they do, the transit technique could potentially reveal a lot about what's on the surface of an exoplanet, such as its mountains or its lakes. Moya showed that this could in fact be done and what it might look like by simulating the effect of Earth's mountains on its light curve if you were looking at it from some alien world. This figure on the left here shows how the light from the sun would be blocked to different amounts due to the surface features on the Earth as it passes in front of and then rotates on its way across the star. And these small variations are all due to the surface features on the Earth. Maya has also studied chemokinematics. Um, when we look up at the night sky with the naked eye, it's hard to imagine that all of those stars that seem so stationary are actually speeding through the galaxy, but they are. And we can group these stars based on which direction they're moving in and at what speed. And these are called moving groups like Caprice also mentioned. This plot on the right here shows a map of this where each of these little points is an individual star plotted along with its speed in each direction in the galaxy. And they're color coded based on which moving group they're in. We think that these stars and these moving groups likely formed all kind of in the same region of the galaxy. And as a result, required similar chemistries within each group. So just like an astronomer's version of a forensic scientist, Moya works on using the chemistry of these observed stars to study where these moving groups formed. And you can read about it all more in depth on her website and learn about the other great work she does. And on her website, like I said, or you can check her out at Go Astromo on Twitter. So this concludes our highlights of six amazing black astronomers. And there are many others that I'd be happy to introduce you to if it weren't for time. So instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have ourselves a little speed dating round so I'll introduce you to the profiles of nine other great astronomers and invite you to check them out for yourselves. So let's jump right into that. First up, we've got John Lewis III at AstroJ3 on Twitter. He is a grad student at Harvard working on star formation. Um, next, we've got Carl Fields at Carl Not Sagan on Twitter. He's a PhD candidate with a joint appointment at Michigan State as well as Arizona State studying things like compact objects and gravitational wave sources. Next is Tenley Hutchinson-Smith at 10 out of Tenley on Twitter, which is one of the most unique usernames I've ever seen, gotta be honest. She's um, a senior physics major, at least was at Spelman College this past spring and has done research on X-ray binaries. Next, we've got Evan Nunez at Evan Hayes Nunez on Twitter. He is an incoming graduate student this fall and has studied pre-main sequence stars. Next, Jamila Pegas 
who's not on Twitter, but you can find her profile if you go to the graduate student section of Harvard's Department of Astronomy. She studies planet formation and protoplanetary disks. Next up is Sinclair Manning at smanning206 on Twitter. She is a PhD student at UT Austin studying star forming galaxies. Next up is India Jackson on Twitter at astro underscore beauty. Uh, she's a PhD student at Georgia State working to predict solar flares. Next is Margaret Acape at Acape underscore Margaret on Twitter. Um, she's a PhD candidate at the University of Toronto probing the reionization of the universe. And last but certainly not least is Osase Omarui at Astro Afro on Twitter, joining the PhD program at Harvard in the fall. And she's done a lot of work studying interstellar bubbles and binary black holes. So that concludes our speed dating round. I'm sure you guys all had a lot of fun. And in the end, uh, I'd like to give a special shout out to Ashley Walker at that Astro Chick on Twitter. Ashley was the founder of the hashtag Black and Astro Week and compiled a really great list highlighting black astronomers and astrophysicists in honor of Black History Month um, that tonight's list was partially compiled from. You can find that on our Twitter page, which I'd invite you guys to all check out. And also, I'd also like to point out another really great resource for you guys to check out. Astrobytes is running a series on hashtag Black and Astro Experiences including interviews, studies, and commentaries. And I believe we'll be putting a link to this in the chat. Otherwise, you can just search this on Google. And with that, thank you all very much for having me. Thank you, Matthew, for highlighting the work and achievements of all of these amazing Black astronomers and also pointing us to more. Um, how did you do this? How did you do your research for this presentation? Like, are there more sources you would recommend for people to look at besides Ashley's list and Astrobytes? Well, um, most of it came honestly from Ashley's list. She did really great profiles, and I assumed some background interviews to introduce these people and give you a little glimpse into the things they do in their life. Um, also, just reaching out to people is a really great thing to do. It's great to meet new people, and um, especially if they do things you are interested in. If you just want to make new friends, it's always great. Um, you can always search on your, if you're at a university, you could search their website for students doing things you like doing. There's resources everywhere. You just got to look for them. Thank you, Matt. That was great. So much amazing. Uh, excellent astronomers out there. So thank you for highlighting that for us today. Um, okay, and so that concludes our, our formal part. Before I um, end the show, um, I want to finish with um, just a few more slides as soon as I can share them. There they are. Uh, eventually, shoot. <laughs> You guys ever have too many desktops open you can't find what you're looking for okay there we go um <laughs> all right um so uh thank you for our i want to give a one more thank you for our amazing speakers um and all the people behind the scenes who are helping to uh, monitor questions and youtube and um, twitter we can't do it without you uh and thank you to the audience who um, has stuck with us through this whole whole uh, virtual um, experiment on our behalf. Um, so thank you so much. We can't do it without you. Yeah, thanks so much. So don't forget to connect with us via Twitter and Facebook, uh, find out about our upcoming shows, other astronomy on tap shows, and also share our events with your friends. Give us comments and feedback. We'd really love to hear from you. And also we'd love to do more of these YouTube streams. So stay in touch. And, um, and with that, um, that concludes the formal part of our show. Um, at this point, we would like to invite the speakers to come back and give you another opportunity to ask questions of our speakers. Um, unfortunately, Caprice could not stay with us, but she, she had to go. But she invites anyone with questions to ask her, contact her on Twitter or on Instagram. Um, she's happy to continue the conversation with you. Um, so uh, with that, 
Um, are there any more questions for our speakers? Thank you for coming back. Um, let's see. I ran out of my own questions. <laughs> Um, let's see, Kishan, um, can you uh, explain a little bit more how the pain does what it does and how basically, how does the deep learning aspect of it work? Sure thing. Uh, so the deep learning part, uh, I mentioned that grid of models, C3K. So Professor Charlie Conroy is the one who kind of put that together. So basically, uh, he himself uses kind of an underlying code that's existed for a long time where that is where the actual models themselves come from. So knowing things about stars like temperature, metallicity, rotational velocity, there's a great many parameters that go into this. We can then model what spectrum should look like and what the spectral energy distribution should look like. And so assembling many different, com you can almost imagine the combinations of all these parameters as like points on a grid in this big parameter space, right? which has as many dimensions as you give it. If it's just temperature and metallicity, that'd be two dimensions. If it's temperature, metallicity, and rotational velocity, that'd be three. But there's there's many. It's like, it ends up in the pain being like 19 different things that get put in. It's huge. Uh, but essentially, um, using this PyTorch, this like Python weird thing that exists that Phil like barely let me peek under the cover and that was, that was enough. <laughs> uh, the code, tra it trains on that grid of models. It learns all the patterns. It's basically like pattern recognition. And so it gets to a point where given an input of a spectrum and or spectral energy, energy distribution, it goes back to its training and it remembers, for example, oh, you know what? I looked at a star that had a temperature of 6,000 Kelvin and a metallicity of 0.1 and you know this parameter and its spectrum looked an awful lot like the one that you just fed me so I think that's my best guess and it spits back that kind of probability data and from that you can get those corner plots that I um, was showing you and so it ends up fitting for like 19 different things some of those are stellar properties like again temperature metallicity velocity um, some of those are more like the, the blaze function, which is a profile of the instrument itself, because you have to account for the fact that the instrument is man-made and not perfect. And so there's some, uh, there's a, like a curve that's gonna happen just on account of the fact that you have a spectrograph that you're taking this data on and people made that, so it's not flawless. Um, so basically like 19 different factors go into the fitting, it reaches back to its training on the grid, and then it interpolates between the lines to give you uh, you know, a probability distribution. Okay. Um, we had a question uh, via Twitter, I believe. Um, has this program been tested against other secondary peaks in high noise situations? Um, um, you had that secondary peak in your one corner plot. Right, right. Uh, since 2017, when I did this, since then, the surveys actually started running. And so I'm not actually sure as far as updates, how it's been doing with situations like that, like secondary peaks, like if that happens, what do we do? Uh, did I test it against anything? Since it was just a summer project, uh, we kind of left the secondary peak, you know, well enough alone. The principal peak contained the, the truth in its like most likely region. So we took that as like, okay, that's fine. Um, but as far as updates, I'm not actually sure. I'd have to ask Professor Conroy what they've been I mean, what they've been learning since taking actual data. Because when I was doing this, it was all just a pipeline thing. It was about trying to understand how well it was going to work when it started taking data in. And since then, now it is. So this is a good reminder. I should probably ask for some updates. Sure. I understand those summer projects. <laughs> They're short term, so it's hard to follow. Yeah. yeah. 10 weeks, 10 weeks. Yeah. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the pro the program that you were just part of at Harvard? Because it's a really cool program. Oh, sure thing. So I was there as part of the uh, Banneker Institute, which is like this really, really fascinating program that I was really keen to get involved in because it, it works at the intersection of two things that I really think are 
super important to me personally, and that's astrophysics and social justice. So um, the structure of the program, just you know, briefly, was like Monday through Thursday, and the mornings we would have a uh, class. We would learn about various astro topics, like I don't know, all kinds of things, like scaling, like like understanding like sizes of things in space and orders of magnitude and, and things like that. And then in the afternoons, we'd work more on uh, research with our advisors. So that's when I would meet with like Professor Conroy and Phil and actually like make progress on what I just you know, showed you and talked about. And then Fridays in the morning, we would do, basically the whole morning was devoted to Python. So we just code, um, get better understanding of how to do all that which I really attribute that to like why I'm even halfway decent at Python now. And then in the afternoons, Friday, we would do the social justice seminar where like there was assigned reading or watching for the week and we would discuss it kind of in a circle on Friday afternoons. And that was like a really great time for um, learning uh, about each other, about ourselves. And you know, anytime you get humans in a room talking about deep topics like that, it's not always gonna be perfect and there's gonna be emotions. And um, it, was, it was an interesting summer, but it was definitely a formative experience. And I have it to thank for a lot of my skills yeah. now. Awesome. Yeah, I've heard really great things about that program. So I just wanted to ask you about it because it seems really sure. cool. Yeah. yeah, it really was. Um, Matthew, can you tell us a little bit about what you studied in undergrad? Yeah, um, so my whole kind of research experience has been centered around studying exoplanets. And over the past 20 years, we've discovered thousands upon thousands. And they tend to be in all sorts of different configurations. And like some of them are really close to each other, orbiting the star. Some of them are really far apart from each other. And these system architectures are a result of all the various different kind of effects and processes that can go on as the system is first forming and subsequently evolving. And what happens is that a lot of these processes aren't studied together. Mm. Um, a lot of the times you'll have, you'll create like a model scenario where one effect is dominant and you just ignore everything else and vice versa. So what I did is I created um, a series of model systems where two processes would kind of overlap and then just let them go and evolve and saw what would happen. Cool, very cool. Um, and did you uh, present your, your work? Um, what have you done with this, with this work? Um, this was for my honors thesis in undergrad. Oh, nice. I presented it somewhat in a way. Um, mm -hmm. We were supposed to have like a full in-person symposium, the whole shebang but we were forced to like record ourselves doing a poster presentation and then like submit it to this thing online. So that was really the extent of that. Um, but wrote a great thesis on it and we're hoping to turn it into a publication um, nice. as the summer rolls on. <laughs> great, good. Um, Jasmine, how about you? Do you wanna tell us a little bit about your research? Yeah, so I'm currently in three right now. Ooh. which was a mistake but um yeah, so my senior thesis was looking at two binaries in the small magellanic cloud and sort of just characterizing because it's a giant and then a white dwarf so it's a symbiotic binary and actually the giant fills the roche lobe so it's orbiting closely enough that the white dwarf is actually treating matter so it's a little puffy um, so, so I ended up eating matter from the, the white dwarf is eating the matter from the, the giant. The yeah. Giant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then I ended up finding the mass and the radius of both stars by fitting models to the SCDs. Um, and I wrote my own code, which was its own adventure, but, um, we ended up actually, we ended up getting values and then also used another code to actually figure out like the period of the system like so how long it takes the giant to like orbit the white dwarf basically uh how fast it's doing that and then the the eccentricity of the orbit and also uh how fast it's actually orbiting the center of the small magic land cloud 
So, so yeah, I'm also trying to get through a publication this summer on my thesis. It's quite a journey. Yeah, it's not as easy as I thought it would be. Uh, no, it's definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> Publishing in science is very hard and arduous and sometimes, uh, dare I say, traumatic. Um, it's, a, it's a bumpy road. <laughs> I love the life we choose to live. <laughs> yeah. Yes, understand. <laughs> Great. At Arizona, I'll be working on the EHT, though, which is entirely different. But Oh, yeah, that's quite a change. Can yeah. you explain really quickly what the EHT is and um, what, it does, what it's done? Yeah, so the event, so EHT stands for Event Horizon Telescope. And so they've imaged both the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, Sag a Sagittarius A star, and then also M87, which is like the famous image that like came out. Famous donut um, plot. Hmm? The donut image. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what I'll be doing as part of the collaboration yet, but I'm excited. Cool. I know there's some grad students here at Arizona who go to the South Pole as part of that project. Yeah. So there's some really cool, exciting uh, work with that project. Nice. Cool. All right. Um, I have not seen any other questions from the audience. Um, so I think I just would like to end by asking uh, the rest of you, what is your na favorite national park? Hmm. Okay, let me do a quick Google search to make sure the one in my head is actually a <laughs> national park. Uh, like, you know, monument, whatever, forest, it's fine. <laughs> I would say Yellowstone, because I feel like it scares a lot of people for absolutely no reason. Interesting. People just love apocalyptic scenarios of super volcanoes. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, plus cool. it was the first one I could think of. I don't really know too many. <laughs> okay. So I Googled it and like, yeah, okay, it is a national park. So it's Acadia, the one in Maine, you yeah. know? Yep. That's I, I like it because I just, Maine is so pretty. Like, I liked it there so much. I thought it was really nice. So I like that one. I haven't been there, but it's on my list for sure. I think I've only been to one state park. But it was Hanauma Bay uh, in Honolulu, so it was pretty Ooh, nice. So, full disclosure: I'm a huge national park nerd. Uh, so uh, when Caprice was talking about all the work, the life that she's lived at national parks and working there, I was really jealous. Uh, for me, <laughs> for me, it's Big Bend in. Oh. Oh, it's just, it's so I, I love it. It's my favorite. Classic. It's so pretty. Uh, all right. Well, um, I, without further ado, I will um, call that the end of the show. Thank you so much for coming out, speakers. You did an amazing job. It was really interesting. Thank you for making our first virtual space draft show a really interesting and amazing success. Of course. And um, with that, I'll call it a night. Thank y'all. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Bye, guys.